All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming this morning uh, to break down printing with Diana. Um, so I'm going to introduce Diana um, and then I'll pass it on over to her. Uh, born in Whitehorse, Yukon and raised in Vancouver, BC, Diana Bartelling Studio is located in Rock Creek, BC, where she now resides. Um, Diana's work is diverse. It reflects her response to social and political issues, her love of mm. nature, with a focus on um, spawning sockeye salmon, the ocean, as well as the Kettle River, where her home and studio are located. Her love of color and of surface design are well displayed throughout her work as she uses the fabrics that she dyes and screen prints in her studio, along with suitable commercial fabrics. She machine stitches for the most part, but often adds hand stitching to add another dimension of texture to her work. Um, Bartelling's desire for the viewer is that they would catch a glimpse of her message but have enough room to have their own thoughts making the work more meaningful to the viewer. Is thank it? you Lizzie. So um, I want to thank the Alberta Council for the Ukrainian Arts for inviting me today. It's uh, a big honor actually to have this opportunity. Um, we're going to talk about breakdown printing and I just want to say that um, I learned to break down print with this book here. It's from Claire Ben and Leslie Morgan. It's called Breakdown Printing. It even came with a DVD so I could watch them do it because I'm a very visual person. So yeah, it's a, a marvelous book. And if you're interested in pursuing breakdown printing, I recommend trying to find it somewhere. Uh, breakdown printing is the process of putting the paint or the thickened dye onto the screen, allowing it to dry, and then printing it off onto the fabric. So I, my piece in On the Bias, the background is all created with the fabric that I screen printed, and we're going to talk about that today. So we're going to start off. Uh, with the chemical water. And the chemical water is what you use to mix your dyes with. And it has uh, two and a half cups of urea in a, a four liter jug, which I already pre measured out. I know that's two and a half cups. And then it has Calgon, which is a water softener. And the recipe calls for four tablespoons, so I just use a bit of a heaping, uh, four teaspoons, so I just use a bit of a heaping tablespoon in there. And then my next product is Ludigal, and Ludigal is a water purifier. So depending where you live, I live with a well, so who knows what really comes in my water. So it's the same thing, only it's eight teaspoons. So I need two heaping tablespoons of the Ludigal. So from there, I need to add a quarter cup of warm water. So I'll just be back. And you can tell I'm nervous because it's not a quarter cup, it's a quarter of a jug. <laughs> so you want to fill it a quarter of the way full with some warm water and then you're just going to shake it up while everything dissolves. And an interesting chemical process takes place while you're doing this and the water cools very quickly. So then once that's taken place and you feel like you're um, urea, which is a little fertilizer pellets, really, is dissolved, then you can fill it up to the top. Now, I'll do that later, but I do have some that's already mixed up to use for today. And I'm going to mix a uh, navy blue. And what I should have done earlier was put my mask on. So I'm going to do that now. I've got some newsprint set out here, which I spritzed with some water because the dye molecules are actually attracted to moisture. 
And so it helps it from spreading too much around my uh, studio. Because dye has a life of its own, and the, especially if the molecules are small, it gets in the air. And then you wash something later on and you have no idea how it has these little specks of color on it. So I try to keep that in mind. So I'm just going to put half an inch to three quarters of an inch of the chemical water. And I always keep chemical water made up. It lasts a very long time. It's just handy to have it ready to go. And then I'm going to add Procyon MX reactive dye. And this is maybe. And I'm just going to add a heaping spoon of that in. So that's a bigger than a teaspoon. But I like lots of color. You can dilute the color with the print paste later. You can see I just dumped a bunch of it on the side there. And so because I have the wet newsprint down, it actually captured that instead of let it fly all around. And then I'll just put that in some water. And so now that it's in a, a solution, I don't need the mask anymore. And I have it well mixed up. So my next step is to put it into some thickened print paste. So the print paste is mixed with the chemical water. I put about a liter, a little more than a liter in a blender. I have a dedicated blender in my dye studio. And then I add a heaping spoon, and this is a one eighth cup measure. I add about a heaping spoon of this into that, and then I blend it. It gets kind of thick, and I leave it, and it just keeps thickening. And you can see the print paste itself is fairly thick, it's not watery. So now I'm going to add some color to my print paste. And this will thin the print paste down as well because it's in fluid. And if you don't have little bottles like this, you can certainly have a yogurt container or something that you stir it up in. Uh, people, some people much prefer that than the bottles. I'm not very good about remembering if I take the stuff out of the thing to not touch my fabric with the spoon and put it back in because your fabric is soaked in sodium alginate to create the chemical bond between the dye and the fabric. Without the sodium alginate, you don't have that same bond. You might get a bit of a stain from your dye, but you won't get the colors that you're looking for. So you can see it mixed up fairly quickly. Wasn't too difficult. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to do a screen. I, I do a drip screen. That is what I did for making my fabric for On the Bias. So I have a screen here. And I'm going to, I put some dye in one with a, a pointier nozzle, a little easier to control. This is thick and dye. And this is black. Um, at the screen we're going to print today is actually with blue. And I'm just going to run a bead up and down the screen. And I'm not too worried about the little bits of extra because I like the little surprises that I get from that. Um, 
you're going to keep the screen at a bit of an angle when you let it dry. I forgot that when I was cleaning up and laid my screen that we're printing today down. So it's, uh, it's lines are a little wider than you might want them to be. I'm just going to put some skinnier lines in between. And so really, that's it. You can see it's dripping down towards the bottom, so the screen will be covered in that respect. I'm going to leave it in here, and I'm going to set it aside. And it'll just keep dripping down, but it will dry. And I will actually probably put it out in the sun as long as I'm not worried we're going to have a storm today and get it good and dry. So I've got that all mixed up. I've got this ready to go. So I'm just going to move this out of the way. And then I'm going to set, change my camera and I'm going to put some fabric down. Now, if you're looking for the perfect print, you're going to want to pin your fabric and you're going to want to use newspaper in between the prints of your screen. Um, I'm not looking for the perfect print. So I am just going to lay my fabric down. I like the serendipity of what happens on its own. This is the screen that I made the other day. Uh, you can see here where it dripped off, but you can see how when I laid it flat, it spread out and it's wider, but that's okay. It'll just create a wider space. So I painted this one in turquoise. This fabric is soaked in soda ash. I tend to soak my fabric in batches and store it in plastic. You can do that for a couple of months. Not silk, but cotton, yeah. And I also dyed linen as well as cotton and silk. So now I'm just gonna turn it over. And I'm going to take the navy blue that we mixed up. I'm just looking at my camera thinking I need to come this way a bit more. Okay, so face side down, I have a well here, right here where I'm going to put some print paste. And then I will pull it through the screen. Now, initially, when I pull through the color, none of the turquoise will probably show up. It will leave those white spaces that you see in the fabric on my, uh, on the bias piece. So what happens is as you add the print paste and you can do it with clear print paste, it doesn't have to be colored. You're going to, um, rehydrate the dried dyes. And as they become more hydrated, more of the color releases onto the fabric. So I'm gonna just pull some color through. And you can see there, the marks that are left behind. So this time I'm gonna change the orientation of my screen. If I was worried about having a clean print there, I wouldn't have completely lifted it off. And I would put a piece of newspaper down here before I move my screen. And I would have reprinted this area to get more color in it. Go. Move it over a little. 
little bit more. You notice I didn't start on the edge of the fabric. That was because you just want to be able to create a more random effect. Now you can see, and you can see on that last one, the turquoise is starting to release. I don't know how well you can see that. I will hold the fabric up when we're done here. Um, as the turquoise releases, I'll have two colors of blue or the navy will look like it's got a ghost edge happening. And the more I pull the print paste over top of it, the more of it releases. So there is a piece that really has quite a bit. That's this one here. You can see the turquoise is starting to show up. So now the other thing I did, and I'm going to do that with the next poll here. Let me add some more color. The other thing I did with my on the bias piece of fabric was that instead of just having stripes, I wanted to have more of a plaid look or a checker, checked box look. So what I did then was I turned the orientation of the screen so that it was across the lines. And now when I pull this, apparently I need more print paste. You'll see the checkerboard line that comes. And so that's the process I used in creating my fabric for On the Bias. Did you want to unmute yourselves and ask any questions? I'm fine with that if anyone has any questions about the printing process. My question is, do you have this process written up? And have you thought of doing that? Like we, we could buy a little booklet from you that has the steps. I don't have the process written up because I use the set set of Claire Ben's book um, called Breakdown Printing. That's where I learned how to do this. Would you give the author's name again? Yes, Claire Ben, B-E-N-N. -N. Okay. And her partner in crime on this book is Leslie Morgan. Thank you. I think their uh, business was called Committed to Cloth. And I feel like I don't think they're working together these days. I'm not sure what's going on. I did have an opportunity to take a class with Claire herself when she was in Canada just before COVID. Um, and yes, I learned a ton about printing and her view on art and simplicity and yeah. So that, that's where I learned how to do this process. Thank so you. I have to give her all the credit. <laughs> okay. So I'm just gonna set this aside. I can finish it up later. I'm gonna switch my camera view back and hold it up. Maybe you'll be able to have a better view of the what happens with the colors. You can see the turquoise is starting to move into it.
So now I've set that screen aside. It's still got all that turquoise. It's going to print for quite a while yet. It can totally dry the way it is. If I wanted to wash out the navy, I'd also wash out the turquoise. So I will just leave it, let it dry, and pick it up and rehydrate it and go again. Diana, did you make your own screens? Yes. Yes, just like I showed you with this screen here. Oh no, did I build my screens? Is that what you yeah. mean? Yeah. No, I, I, I've tried that. I just can't quite get the screen taut enough. Huh? So I prefer to spend the money and then I just tape it up with the duct tapes and I just swap that out when it just gets beyond. So I was talking about the screens. I, like I say, I just, I have tried and you don't have to do the duct tape. You can take the wood. Here's a, a new screen that I haven't even opened yet. So this is what it looks like before I put the duct tape on it. Um, you just take it out of the plastic and you could varnish the wood and that helps uh, the process. But I, I just learned to do it with the duct tape. So that's what I do. Hmm. Yeah. And I have a ton of screens. I, I love screen printing. <laughs> My gosh. And I, you I'm love printing. To show you one of my salmon that I have been printing. So all the dye is not left on. But so I use this process with my salmon as well. Mm hmm. So I paint them on the screen, let them dry, and then print them. And I either use clear print paste if I'm going on to something colored and I want to maintain that integrity. Or if I'm going on to white, I often use a color, often the green of the face and I won't and tail and fins, and I won't fill those in. I'll let that be the same color as the background. Uh -huh. so to me, it's endless what you can do with this breakdown printing. You know, you can put just one color on the screen and put objects in it, let it dry. You pull the objects out and those shapes are left behind. So. Very cool. And where do you get your screens from? I buy them either from Opus or from uh, Maywa yeah. down in Vancouver. They had a sale on, so I on the big screen. So I was lucky to pick that up for about half price, which is mm -hmm. really nice. Yeah. So, and I don't like the metal ones. I have a couple of those. And I think it's the screen itself. I just, this is with, the, I was thinking, oh, great. I don't have to duct tape it. It'll just be easy to clean. But the screen itself, the prints just, had a funky almost like a wave pattern to them which oh. i really felt was coming through the screen so so cool any more questions about the printing process because I thought I would like to talk about my piece for a few minutes if, if we have time. It sounds great. So this is my piece. It's called The Hidden Shame of Colonialism. And when On the Bias came out, they had discovered the bodies of 215 children at a residential school in Kamloops. And I, this is not my first piece done on a residential school. The first piece I did was on a school up in the Yukon where I was born. Um, the school itself was in Carcross and it was called Chutla. It became a, like a free school, a different kind of school, but people that weren't First Nations ended up going there from far away and yeah. 
so that was a partnered piece where we each did one that was called abstracted and one did the abstract and one did the representative but this one is it just really spoke to me i'm gonna see if i can blow it up here so you can see in my screen printing process all these little white squares that were left and I put a little white cross in each one to represent the children. Some of them have two. Here we have three in a row. What happened was terrible. Um, I can't even talk about most of what had happened. You can see here that there's these X's that I stitched in. And those are to represent how the children's culture and language were crossed out of their lives. So when, if they went home, they couldn't even speak to their families anymore. They could not speak the language. They did not have the culture. They did not have the uh, the knowledge that they would have gained had they stayed at home. I put this lace, I put some of this fabric on the black cross and the lace over it because I felt the church almost decorated themselves with these poor children as they were trying in their minds to colonialize them, to make them like the white man, to educate them instead of learning their way of life and maybe finding a way to integrate it. So it's an emotional piece for me. Uh, I do have a First Nations heritage that was lost. My great, great grandmother who comes we're not even sure where, we don't know what tribe we come from. Um, somewhere in Alberta or the Dakotas possibly. She had a child with this man and I don't know whether she and the child were whisked away to England, but the child was and she was raised there. Her name was, interestingly, her name was Diana. And I have a picture of my grandmother wearing, who I imagine is her grandmother's regalia. So we did get some identification. That's why we know probably where they came from. But in my family, it was really never talked about. It was like a secret that we had for indigenous heritage. And so, as I tried to embrace it, and when my kids went to school, they didn't want to be identified as Aboriginal, which I think is unfortunate. But the way we had been raised, we ha I have none of that heritage in my culture. So it, it happened in a lot of ways. Um, I listened to an interview with my grandmother. Someone was doing some research and sent me this interview and she talked about Judge Begbie. And he was known, I think, as the hanging judge. And his statue, I think, has been removed, one of the ones that have been removed, which I'm not sure. I think that it would have been better to put a plaque with the story there. She really liked him. And she really felt he was helping the Indigenous people. Even though she had that heritage and she knew about that heritage. So it, it gave me a whole different perspective on where my grandmother was coming from. So it just goes to show we don't really know the whole story. And that's why those little crosses are hidden in the white. And if you don't go up close, you don't see them. It's wonderful. Thank you, Linda. Are there any questions about any of that? 
or statements, oh. comments? Yeah, I do have a question for you there, Diana. Uh, now, did you place your printed fabric around the cross? Are those separate pieces that you sewed together and then you sewed within the cross the squares of your printed fabric on top? Yes, that's exactly oh. what I did. I cut up my printed fabric. I put it together with the cross. It just gave it a little bit more movement in the piece instead yes. of having it static and putting the cross on top of the fabric. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then it was after I had made that portion of it that I decided I was gonna add the other to the cross itself and decorate the cross with that. Okay, well, it's, it's very effective. Thank you. It's, it's very striking. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Well, I, I think if there's no other questions or comments, I just really want to thank Lizzie for hosting us today. And uh, just on a personal note, I just want to say how heartbroken I am about the Ukraine. And I'm sure that in your gallery that you guys are doing something to help out there. And yeah, it's life is difficult <laughs> absolutely thank you thank you so much diana for presenting this this is fantastic and your piece is one of my favorites in the entire exhibit it's a beautiful piece definitely thank you yeah we have our um art art for aid campaign we uh 100 of the proceeds from select pieces donated by local artists um wonderful artists um go towards the canada ukraine foundation um but yeah thank you again um mm -hmm. i just wanted to ask for your piece, how many um, layers basically did you print for this? Because there's so many, like the range of colors, the range of shades. So some of that comes as the die is released from the screen. So this screen was was had more than one color of stripe on it. The one that I printed today and the one I, I made today were just made with one color. But this one was made with chino, which is a brown, a dark brown when on, it can be dark. Um, it tends to go golden on silk, but on cotton, it's brown. It was with chino and black and golden yellow. And so you can see as I was pulled, I pulled an orange through it. And you can see as it started to release, the golden yellow and the black were really showing up. Uh, some of the orange became strong and um, the chino, it really didn't show that well except to create the edges. How did you get the white to stay in there? So that was what I showed you today. You can see that there's white in where I pulled through uh, with the blue. So I was probably at some point using some clear print paste pulling through once the thing started to release. And when you mm. wash it, it's amazing. The white stays white if you wash the, the proper way. It lifts up all the loose dye and does not redeposit it back on. Mm. Yeah. So Diane, when you wash your piece, Diana, when you wash your piece, do you have to like scrub it to get the paste out of it or just soak it in a gentle water? How do you, how do you set the stuff after? Okay, so you, you start with cold water and you agitate it. It's, it's a bit of a process to wash out your fabric. You agitate it while you're, you're soaking it. You make sure it's good and wet and you'll see the color starts to release. And then as you see more, as the water starts to clear up, then you ch dump that water and you start to change the temperature. And at the end, you're using really hot water and you'll be amazed how much color comes out at the end uh, with the hot water. And I use a little drop of something called Synthropol, which is like an industrial soap. I put a little drop of that in and do a few rinses through that still. And as that gets quite clear, 
Then I put it in my washing machine with the hot, hot water because I don't think I can get the, the sewing machine or the washing machine to get quite that hot because it starts with the cool coming in. I throw it in there and I put Synthropol in there and I do a speed wash with an extra rinse. And it seems to work quite well. Is it possible to batch, like to do that with several pieces at a time? You Are want to make time? sure they're color light. Okay. Otherwise they can, as they touch each other, transfer. Because remember, you've got something called soda ash on your fabric. Like, right. it, it, like you soak your fabric and you let it dry. And that fabric has the soda ash permeated in it. And it's what creates the chemical bond. So if you've got soda ash in your fabric and some loose dye floating around from another piece, and they're touching each other, it might pick that up. And if you really want a clean print, uh, you might, I tend to just wash one at a time. I loved your piece too. I was there when we hung it and it's, it's just stunning. So, and my other question is now, when you are working on your work, do you keep a good print journal of what you do on each piece or <laughs> you just get lost? <laughs> I'm terrible. <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't, I journal before I work, interestingly enough. And as I look through my journals, my work never looks like what I started out with. <laughs> but it's my jumping off point, the journal. And uh, then once I get into the piece, the journal is far from my mind. Yeah, I have tried. I've, I've tried saving little swatches of my dye piece and making notes and and I guess because I'm more serendipitous in my work that I'm not going to try and recreate the exact same thing again. You know, mm -hmm. one of the few things I recreate again and again and again is the salmon. Um, I'm still working that out. Yeah. But every piece is its own piece, I guess. Mm. You can, I mean, this makes sense to me, but I don't know, I always ask questions. You can then take a piece that you did with one screen and you half like it, but then reprint it with another screen. Absolutely. Do you have to re-soda ash it or not? Or is the soda ash from the first time sufficient? Well, if you haven't washed it out, you're fine. Okay. If you have, and if you have, haven't left it in the open air, I have a couple of pieces here that I've had left in the open air since, June, January. Really, I need to wash them out and re-soak them. Had I put them away in a plastic bag, I'm just going to look for my bag that I keep my stuff in. I have these great bags that I use. Can you see me on my little top? Oh, yeah. um, here's one that's got a print on it that's in here. So when I, if I want to go and reprint over top of it, I should be fine. Like I can feel the soda ash in this. Right, so it's got, you can hardly see it because it's pale, uh -huh. but, and maybe I wash it out and re-soda ashed it and threw it in here and just haven't reprinted it yet. Okay. I tend in the summertime to have friends come over and I set up, I moved my husband's truck out of his shrine and set up dye tables, print tables in there. And we sort of do once a week or once every two weeks and just make a bunch of fabric for fun, experiment. I would like to echo that that piece that you made, Diana, is absolutely stunning. Thank really you. Really stunning work. It's I think so when it's meaningful to you, I think it translates out. I'd like to thank Diana so much for this. This was absolutely fantastic. It was so great to have the demonstration and then to hear you talk about your work. It's such a beautiful piece. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed this.